I've got a show coming up and I'm going to talk a little bit about the equipment that I'll be taking to play this show, why I'm choosing these particular pieces of equipment, and things that you can think about when you go to do a show as far as what gear you're going to take. So when you're going to play a gig, there's a lot of things that you have to think about when determining what gear you're actually going to take with you. When you play in different styles of bands, different styles of music, what you're playing is going to dictate what you take to the show. Obviously, if it's just an acoustic duo, you'll have your acoustic guitar and maybe a backup plus whatever PA equipment you might need. In my case, I'm going to be playing straight up rock and roll, classic rock, and it's going to be a five-piece band and we're playing at a local bar that also doubles as a venue. They also have good food too. The first thing you have to think about is what your set list is going to be. And I have the set list for the show that's coming up, but I won't give away any surprises. But I can say I'll be doing some ZZ Top, some ACDC, as well as some maybe not quite as hard uh, rock and roll tunes. There's some Black Crows, there's some Billy Joel, things like that. So the first thing is I've got to cover a wide range of sounds. This always leads to the question, how many guitars is enough? You have to think about the guitar as a tool and what you're going to use that tool for. When you look at the amount of guitars that I have around me, it looks like I have a lot of guitars, but each one does something different or unique. So for starters, this is going to be the main instrument that I play. Uh, I never take just one guitar, but if I had to take one guitar, it would be this one. This is an Epiphone uh, Les Paul. This is considered the standard pro. Uh, I actually got this. this. This almost qualifies as dirt cheap. It's a little on the high end, maybe. I traded it for about four or $500 worth of bass gear a few years ago. And the reason that I use this one, well, it looks pretty nice. Secondly, I can do a lot of different sounds with it. Now, traditionally, Les Pauls sound a certain way. So here is just a clean sound. Uh, I'm using a Boss Katana and it's set up with kind of a, um, kind of like a Fender reverb kind of sound. Okay, it's a little bit bassy um, the way it's set up right now, but with this guitar and the way the amp is set, not using any kind of effects, I can get multiple sounds because this one has what are called coil splits. And so underneath these pick guard covers, there are basically humbuckers that are two single coils kind of put together. But by pulling up on a volume knob, I can actually split those coils, meaning that it's only using one or other of the, the two pickups. And what happens is you get a much uh, a sound, it's not quite like a single coil, but it's much closer. So that's humbucker. And then this is the split coil. So I can get different sounds directly out of the guitar. It also does it on the neck pickup as well, just by pulling up on the other volume control. And if I have both split and go to center, I get almost a Strat sound out of it. It's not exactly a Strat, but it's close enough to not have to carry extra guitars. So in addition to this guitar, I'll probably be taking the Stratocaster that's on the wall there and possibly the Kramer, when I'll talk about these more in just a minute. One of the reasons that I usually take um, a Fender style guitar is just there's certain songs that we do that I've been doing them so long, it's, it's strange to play it on a Les Paul. So if I'm doing any kind of Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff, um, Allman Brothers, I can go either way with Allman Brothers, but there's just some songs where, uh, some blues stuff where I'm just used to the way the Stratocaster plays and responds. Also, if I'm doing any Hendrix and I'm using a fuzz or something like that, uh, the way the single coils interact with the fuzz is very different from the way humbuckers interact. And even though I can split these coils and get a different sound, it's 
it's still not exactly the same. The Katana amp I have set up with a few different tones, and I'm recording that through uh, Shure SM57 that I did a video on a few weeks ago, and that's what will be going to front of house. I still don't use in-ear monitors yet, uh, but I am looking at trying to get some in-ear monitors at some point in the future. So I'm old school in that I like to have an amp on stage because of the way the guitar interacts with the amp. That being said, you still have to be aware of the overall stage volume. So that's why I'm not taking the 100 watt Marshall. Uh, the venue that we're playing is smaller and you're going to want to use a less powerful amp. And the Katana, even though I'm using the 100 watt version, I'll only have it set on at most 50 watts. Uh, more than likely the lower gain setting. It really depends on uh, the volumes once we get the drums going and everything like that. So if I was playing a larger venue, someplace that maybe could hold a few hundred people, I might use the Marshall for that just because on a larger stage, obviously you have more room to kind of distance the amplifier from the rest of the band. Sometimes they don't even have the amp on the stage. Maybe they put it somewhere else. Larger shows, sometimes the amps are actually below the stage. Um, if you've ever seen a U2 show, all the amps are actually stored below the actual stage. So there's an, a better way to get a control of the overall volume that's on stage. So the way I have this set up, I'll have a few clean tones like this one. Maybe some kind of slightly distorted tone. Where it's kind of just a little bit beyond edge of breakup. Now one thing about using amps like this that have multiple patches, uh, including things like the Helix and the um, Boss GT1000, the biggest problem you're going to have is getting the volumes somewhat consistent between the patches. So what I've been doing today is actually just had the amp hooked up to the computer and I'm going through and kind of getting the sounds kind of the way I want them because I also use a pedal board. And I do that really to give me flexibility. And that's what I was talking about, about knowing the material that you're going to play. Because when you're in a cover band and you do a wide range of uh, cover songs, you're going to have to be replicating sometimes very different guitar sounds with the stuff that you have. So you want to pick out gear that you'll be able to take uh, as much as you need to be able to cover all the sounds. Now you can get overboard. You can go and say, oh, on that album they were using uh, a Plexi Marshall, and so I want to go and spend all this money, or I want to get a two rock amp, which is, you know, 2,500 bucks, because that's what John Mayer was playing on this particular song. You have to understand a concept that we call the law of diminishing returns. And what that means is as you get to your goal, the money that you put into your equipment uh, is the, what you're going to get out of it is going to is going to reduce as you get closer to your goal. So maybe it costs you four hundred dollars to get a guitar that's going to get your sound 80 percent there. Well, to get it that last 20 percent, you might have to spend another two thousand dollars to maybe get a, a, a Gibson Les Paul to be able to achieve that, you know, that sonic palette that you're looking for. The thing is, is the audience actually going to be able to tell the difference? And 99% of the time it's no, unless you have other cork sniffing guitarists out in the audience that are going, oh no, well I would have used this particular piece of equipment. I don't buy into all that. I mean, if you have the money to get the, the nicer equipment, by all means do it. But don't strap yourself uh, to get that equipment when you really have to know the gear that you have to be able to dial it in to get the sounds uh, most of the way there. Because buying the gear is not necessarily going to get you the sound that you're looking for. I've got extra 
effects here, mostly to be able to widen the palette, so to speak. So I can come in here with this clean Fender reverb sound, and then if I want some distortion on it, I can throw on the um, Electro Harmonics Soul Food, which is a Klon clone. I'm also using a Boss Super Overdrive. And you'll see that when I turned it on, the volume dropped. So that's why you have to go through and make sure that all of your levels are set. What I'm looking for is that when I go from the clean sound to the distorted sound, I don't want a big jump in volume. Now there will be an apparent change in volume because of just the nature of how we respond to distorted tones. And in addition to that, I've got a fuzz. And a fuzz sounds kind of, to me, sounds weird with humbuckers. But what I like about the fuzz is that it cleans up when you turn the volume down. And of course, each guitar is going to sound different with these different effects. So you kind of have to um, have everything set for a happy medium. Uh, some people use a booster at the front. Uh, so when you switch to uh, something like a Strat with single coils, that the output is going to be a little bit lower than, than humbuckers, you can boost that signal up so you get about the same kind of volume out of all the different effects. Other things I have, I have an old uh, Ibanez phaser. Uh, and delay and reverb that I use for different things. Uh, we used to do Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin, and I would use that digital delay uh, as a way to uh, kind of recreate the... Um, midsection of that song with all the crazy guitar sounds and everything. I could just reach down and, and change it. That's another thing about using devices like the Boss Katana is the controls are behind you. Um, you kind of have to preset all of your effects. Uh, and if you want to tweak things on the fly, sometimes that's, that's kind of difficult. Uh, some of the more advanced parameters in the, in the Katana, you have to go in and use the software to actually set those uh, those advanced things. Here I can just reach down and, and change the setting. An analog delay sometimes works better for that uh, and there's a setting on here where it kind of simulates that but I don't have it turned on. So Okay, so now I've got the Kramer Pacer. I take this for when I have to do songs that I need a vibrato or, or a whammy bar. And um, we've got at least one Van Halen song that we do, maybe two, um, and probably a couple of Billy Idol songs that I'll probably use this on. Uh, and it's because it's got the vibrato bar. So, for the Van Halen stuff, I already have a sound preset. Now, this is all the katana that's doing these, these sounds. And one thing you have to have to get close to the Van Halen sound 
is having uh, a phaser turned on. So here's the sound without the phaser. And here's the phaser. Uh, and then I also have a boost set on it, so if I want to do... Some of the more advanced tricks and stuff, you kind of have to have a lot of gain. The way I have the pedal board st set up, I can stack that gain into the amp. So here it is again, and let me add on one of the drives. So again, it's not 100% of the way there. I mean, I can hear it in the room here and there's like, yeah, it's, it's pretty close, but it's not exactly the sound uh, that you would expect, um, you know, from Van Halen. And I can also put a different phaser in front of it as well for more of an effect. <laughs> On those albums, he was using, I believe, an MXR script uh, phaser. I have to remember. Um, but anyway, so it's got that particular sound with it, and that's actually emulated in the katana. So in the patch I, I played first, it's actually got a little bit uh, closer to that sound. Let me switch sounds here. <laughs> I can do the more uh, cleanish, funky kind of sounds. And again, the fuzz always works better with the single coils. sweep the tone. And you can see each effect kind of colors the sound. Okay, so lastly I've got my 2018 um, Fender. This is the uh, Professional, I believe, is the, the model. It's USA made. So far, I've been really happy with it. There's a couple of things I'm going to change. I, uh, it, com it comes with nines as the standard gauge, and I have been experimenting with what's called a balanced tension uh, tens. And so it's a slightly heavier gauge, but the gauges aren't like a standard set of tens, so that the tension is actually equal across all the strings. Um, it, it's okay. Uh, I still think the nines kind of work the best. The problem is I'm really heavy-handed and sometimes nines are a bit light for me um, where, you know, I can just bend it way more than what it needs to be bent. <laughs> And I would have problems with, um, I have another the, uh, 335 kind of knockoff guitar that um, with nines on it, when I'm fretting certain chords, I actually bend them out of tune. So um, I've, I've had to step up and go to a heavier string on that. And that's the, um, the reverb deluxe reverb uh, emulation using the soul food in front of it. Uh, 
Um, so that's what I use this guitar for. That those types of songs. Uh, it also does really well with the fuzz. That's also why if you use a fuzz, you want it at the very front of your effects chain. You don't want anything between the guitar and the fuzz because fuzz works best with unbuffered, um, an unbuffered signal. Uh, if you have any kind of compressor or like a boss pedal that has a buffer so it's even passing the signal, you know, it's doing something to the signal even when it's off, it's not gonna be as responsive. And what you want is for that fuzz to clean up. How well it cleans up depends on how well you have everything set. It, sometimes it takes some experimentation, but you know if you want to get any of those Hendrix sounds, you know it's it's a fuzz that he had a uh, fuzz face going into the Marshall Plexi that he used. Um, here it is with the Super Overdrive. <laughs> Now, the pedals that I'm using aren't finalized yet, but I can say I'll definitely be using the Super Overdrive and the Soul Food. Um, the fuzz, the fuzz I have is actually the mod tone, the fuzz. Uh, I'm kind of late to the game of using fuzzes. I, I really didn't use a fuzz pedal for years until maybe three or four years ago and started kind of dipping my toe, so to speak, into the you know, and some of you might say, God, you know, you played for a long time without using a fuzz. It is what it is. I mean, there's just been so many, um, you know, back in the day, you, you only had a, a couple of choices in fuzz. Uh, you either had to spend big money to get, get, you know, to get a vintage pedal or, you know, you get one of the um, reissue fuzz faces or something. And everybody kind of knew what that was about. Or maybe you got uh, like a big muff or something. And I just, I just never really got into them. Um, but there's so many, want, so many that are out there now, uh, where um, new builders have come along, and um, there's just you know a wider range. And so, just by trying some of the different pedals, you'll find something that you know that kind of speaks to you or, or what you like. Um, the other pedals I'm using are kind of industry standards. I've got a you know a TU3 Boss Tuner. Um, I've got a few other pedals that I've picked up over the time for reviewing with Dirt, Dirt Cheap Guitar, and I, I, there's a couple of them that I may be uh, putting onto the board, but that's, um, you know, just some experimentation. So what I'm hoping that you get out of this video is that you really kind of have to think about what you're going to be playing and what you take with you. I can tell you from when I've played in bands that were original bands, didn't do covers and things, unless we did maybe a few here and there, uh, it was much easier then because you could kind of get your sound and you kind of ran with it. When you're doing covers, now you've got to be able to emulate uh, a lot of different players. So in some respects, I think it can be more difficult uh, to, to do covers, especially if you want to be true to the originals. Personally, I kind of like to tweak the originals a little bit and come up with something different, uh, just because you know 
people aren't expecting it, you to do a particular song, uh, you know, a, a new way or a different way. And of course, sometimes some of the songs that we love actually are remakes and they tend to be better than the originals. Uh, one of the best examples is All Along the Watchtower by Hendrix. Uh, basically, the first time that Bob Dylan heard it, who actually wrote the song, he was just floored at how, you know, he knew then it was Hendrix's song. Even though he wrote the, the melody and stuff, uh, Hendrix just took it and took it to a completely different level uh, as far as what he was, was doing with the song. And to me, that's kind of interesting when you can kind of come up with your own take on uh, different cover tunes. It really depends on the venue that you're playing. Sometimes they want you to play, you know, the exact versions. If you are playing wedding gigs, uh, it needs to be pretty close to the actual versions. They don't want a whole lot of experimentation. You're not going to get into a 20-minute fish-style jam uh, in doing, doing a wedding cover gig. So, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon and you'll be notified whenever I post new content or if I decide to start streaming and go live with different things. Uh, if you have comments for videos that you'd like to see me do or different things you want me to review, I've got a few things in the works that different uh, viewers have suggested uh, that I'll be, be coming out with at, at some point as I have time to, to do these videos. Remember, the only player that you have to be better than is the one you were yesterday. So, keep practicing.